Well, thank you for joining us this afternoon for Healthier Sleep for a Healthier Brain. We would like to note that the information in this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Our information is intended to empower individuals, their families, and healthcare professionals who want to collaborate in the most effective ways on this journey to health and well being. Please see a licensed and qualified medical professional for your medical needs. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box um, or raise your hand to unmute and we will um, get those questions um, answered. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Steve Ledvina. He is our board chair and he's going to give a short program update and then introduce our speaker. Hi everyone, welcome. Happy Valentine's Day. It's wonderful to see a lot of familiar names. Um, so here at Sharp again, our mission is to educate and empower people to take charge of their cognitive health. We do this by helping to support people through webinars like this one, in-person presentations out in the community, printed materials, and a very informative website. But by far the most effective, how if you could go forward a slide so that people can digest that while we jump in. But by far the most effective offering is our small group program. There's some details on the screen and I'll talk about those now. So this program offers a live education and support facilitated by a certified health coach. It's now going into its fourth year and it improves with every single program we run. The next one starts April 25th. It's a 6 p.m. Eastern time group that meets via Zoom. You'll have six group sessions with the whole small group and your health coaches, and then two one-on-one -on -one sessions with a health coach. So each small group program participants begin to identify and modify lifestyle factors that might be impacting their brain health. They learn, and really importantly, learn from other people's experiences, that community aspect has been really one of the most valuable pieces to our participants. During the small group program, we focus on four lifestyle areas, stress, sleep, nutrition, and exercise, all of which greatly affect our cognition. Our participants have access to an online teaching platform that has educational videos, quizzes, and resources that accompany each topic module, uh, which prepare them for the coaching, the group coaching sessions. All of that is done for only a program price of $99. It's significantly subsidized by the generosity of our donors. It's really a $450 value. We love that we're able to offer it at that $90 price to make it accessible to as many people as possible. So if you're just beginning to notice some memory impairment or you want to learn and get ahead of things to keep your brain sharp for as long as possible, this program is an excellent place to start. I'll also just note that it's not on here, but after the program, if you want ongoing and continued support, we also have a Maintain Your Brain program that meets monthly indefinitely. That'll be starting around the same time as this program. Oh, if we could advance to the next slide, I want to talk about our next webinar after this one. Um, our next webinar will be on March 13th at 12 Eastern time with Dr. Cornelia Lenher, themed as brain health and blood sugar, where you'll gain an understanding of how your blood sugar impacts your brain health. So super valuable topic, really exciting to have Dr. Lenher on board. Now, for what we're all here for today, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Howard Hinden. Dr. Hinton is the co-founder and president of the Academy of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry, AAPMD, and the Foundation for Airway Health. These organizations were created to prevent the proliferation of chronic disease by raising awareness about airway, sleep, and breathing issues and offering training and education. He's also the first dentist elected to the board of the American College for Advance Advancement of Medicine. Dr. Hinden's participation in Sharp Again's vital mission furthers his desire to support the importance of collaborative care and the medical dental connection. 
He is a member of our board and also serves on our medical and dentistry advisory board. He has presented important position papers to dental and medical groups throughout the country. His research into the dental medical connection has shaped the medical community's understanding of this growing and important field. And personally, I'll just say he's one of the most impactful people in the, the health field that I've ever seen. Uh, and it's a true pleasure to have him here. So welcome and thank you for joining us, Dr. Hinden. Well, thank you, Steve. And uh, Shop again, I just want to give a shout out that uh, Shop again, what a great group. I've been a board member ever since its founding and watched its growth and the great information. So uh, if any of you are new, are new to these webinars, make sure you keep visiting the Shop again site for, for more information. So this is a rare position. Usually I'm hosting webinars rather than than uh, giving them. And what I tell everybody when I'm doing a webinar, hosting a webinar, is I want it to be interactive. I know all this stuff. And my goal is that you will know it better. So if you have any questions, whatever they are, even if you think they're re they're a ridiculous question. Probably somebody else has the same question. So don't be shy. There's no such thing as a um, as, as a bad question. Just ask your, ask your question. Uh, at the end of this time, I want you to know a lot more about sleep uh, than you know now. So let's go on next one. Okay, so our objectives today is for everybody to increase their knowledge of sleep, and be more aware of the far-reaching effects of uh, of sleep and breathing, and how to assess yourself and your family, and then the need for collaboration because, as you'll see, that sleep is a very has a lot of tentacles reaching out in different areas. So you really need collaborative uh, approach, and for each person that might be different. And uh, the value of a health coach could be very important because they can pull the pieces together. So when I was a kid and I learned that we sleep a third of our life, I said, oh my God, what a waste. If I, if I live to be 90, 30 years of my life, I'm going to be spending sleeping. Um, and I said, my goal would be, how do I avoid sleep so that I could get more out of, get more out of life? Uh now I've come to realize the vital role that sleep plays in in uh, protecting us, restoring us. Uh, and sleep is really an incredibly miraculous thing that I don't think we really uh, appreciate as much as we should. So everything has a rhythm. Everything has a time of, of growth, maturity. Uh, there are rhythms to the year. There are rhythms to the, to the day. And we were meant to follow these rhythms and these these cycle, and uh, and go with them. Unfortunately, our modern uh, society have given us the ability to ignore them, ignore them completely, and not be aware of them. And and like and we are we are paying a price for that. So I I got some sleep quotes from different different people. Um, which, which I think are great. Uh, William DeMent was like the father of sleep uh, medicine. Uh, he wanted to be a, he, he wanted to be a uh, guitarist. Couldn't make a living as a musician, so he, he went into medicine and sleep. But uh, one of the things he said was, can people not sleep? So he did an experiment where he took uh, a subject held their eyes in an open position, shined bright lights on them, played loud music, and they still fell asleep anyway. So, so sleep is not anything that you can, you can say you can get rid of completely. The interesting thing about that was that was his uh, lab assistant who later became his wife. So uh, that, that was an unusual first date. The other thing, uh, I like what George Carlin says about sleep. If you would tell somebody that you're going to go into a state where you're completely unresponsive 
you don't know what's going going on you lose consciousness and um but but you're still alive and a time and sometime during that period of time you have these visions dreams where you can do the most incredible things and then you wake up and everything is back to normal and the last thing is what steve sheldon who was a member of our, of our aapmd board a while ago said sleep is the most personal and selfish thing we do we, we can we can go to bed with somebody but when we go to sleep we go to our own world we sleep differently two people sleeping in the same bed uh, can have completely different sleep uh, when my when we wake up in the morning uh, my wife rose's side of the bed is like she never slept in it. it all she has to do is pat the covers down my side of the bed looks like there was there, there's been a war on my side of the bed people sleep uh differently so what does a good night's sleep do these are a good night's sleep will give you these benefits it restores our energy it consolidates memory it consolidates it removes the waste from uh, our brain and the rest of our body a blood pressure drops um for most of the night except when we're in uh REM sleep in which case it, it rises uh our glucose levels will fall during the during the uh during the night so we, it's the lowest in the morning so we wake up and we're hungry uh if we're sleeping well our immune system resets our microbiome reset bacterial levels that go up during the day go down at night our digestion uh we, we're digesting food and uh ideally we should have our last meal at eight o'clock because our liver wants to go to sleep at 10 o'clock based on our, our biological clock and uh if we eat at the right time we sleep better because we digest a food and, and, and it supports detoxification so i'm going to take a little brief sidetrack and talk about the autonom autonomic nervous system so if everybody can just put in the chat box whether you know what the autonom autonomic nervous system in is can i view the chat box yeah yeah so the autonomic nervous system is that part of our nervous system that never consults us. It takes care of all the things that we need to do. It uh, controls our heart rate, our respiration rate, uh, whether our blood vessels are constrict or whether they, ex they expand. Good, we're getting a lot of yeses. I like that. Um, and, it, and it's really an amazing thing. Uh, Nick Gonzalez wrote a really great book about the autonomic nervous system. And he said, and he gave a, one, a description. We're on an airplane. We're about to get rid of, get off the airplane. We want to get our luggage out of the overhead head compartment. At the moment we think about that, the, uh, blood, the blood vessels to the muscles that we need to, to do that action dilate and allow more blood flow to those those muscles and only those muscles in the body it, and it happens instantly so our autonomic nervous system is responsible for maintaining basically maintaining our existence our survival is based on our autonomic nervous system functioning and it, there's two parts the sympathetic which is basically how we put out energy when we want to do things and the parasympathetic which helps us absorb energy and so it's so it's sort of like a uh, being on a brake in a pedal when we want to do more we press on the on the brake which is sympathetic when we want to slow down we we press on the on the uh, on the brake and activates the parasympathetic why is that important because all of our organs that are below our diaphragm are under sympathetic tone and um, 
the heart and lung and, and our muscles are all under uh, sympathetic tone. So anything that, that's needed to survive, breathe faster, heartbeat faster, uh, get the muscles moving so we can run away, fight, and, 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 uh, and survive, that's sympathetic. The organs below the diaphragm, digestion, elimination, sexual functions, are all under parasympathetic control. So it's never one or the other. It's always modulated, just like we can continue to press our, our, our foot on the brakes and the, uh, and, and the accelerated to go faster or, or slower. Um, was there a question here? Okay. So, Joan, are you monitoring the questions? Yes. Okay. So the, the reason it's important to understand that is in order to get a good night's sleep, we have to be able to shift out of sympathetic into a uh, parasympathetic tone. That, that if we maintain our sympathetic hypervigilant state, we're not going to sleep well. So, so the, the things that might, might affect that are stress, number one, watching the news at night, which is always going to arouse our sympathetic tone, no matter what, what you believe in. Um, if we exercise too close to bedtime, if we have too, if we eat too late or we eat the wrong type of food will also uh, affect our, our mode. So a good night's sleep is, um, is based on two, two things. So we have two things that control sleep. One is our sleep-wake balance, which is, I have marked with parentheses S, and that's, that's our drive to sleep. So the, the moment we wake up, we're, we're full of pep and energy. As the day progresses, we get more tired. As we go to sleep, we begin to restore our sleep. We pay our, our sleep debt off for the day, and we begin to build up a, a reserve. So if that was the only factor that, that governed sleep, we would get wake up full of pep and energy, go out about our day and then get tired during the end of the day and, and it would be it, it would be that cycle. But we also our sleep is also controlled by a biological clock. And a biological clock gives us two periods of sleepiness. One is going to be between like two and four in the afternoon, which is when people in Europe usually take their their break. And um, and uh, and one and three a.m. In, in in the morning. And if people get disrupted, or they work a night shift, that that could throw their biological clock. So this balance between our sleep wake balance and our, and our and our biological clock is what gives us the right pro the proper sleep and keeps us awake when we're supposed to be awake. Um, also, when we go to sleep, there's this nice shift where things calm down. We begin to produce the nighttime neurotransmitters, melatonin, GABA, uh, and serotonin, and acetylcholine. These are these are all the things that set the stage and, and help us keep us in a good state of, of sleep. As we wake up in the morning, then the exciting, uh, stimulating neurotransmitters, dopamine, epinephrine, and neuroepinephrine, um, come into effect. So we're supposed to get up. We we're hunter gatherers. We go about our day, and this this is what provides us with the stimulation to do that. We're also in an ideal good sleep. That um, our glucose level has gone down, as I said before, gone down through the night, and we wake up hungry and with, with an appetite, and our blood pressure falls. And, and and everything sort of calms down, and uh, and the brain is cl cleaned, and things are really f refiled and organized properly. Uh, this is a quote by Desmond Tutu, which I I love. Then we have one of our board members, Dave McCartney. He's a sleep physician. He's also a cartoonist. Uh, put it in a cartoon form, and basically, it it says. We have to stop pulling people out of the river and go upstream to see what the problem is. 
And this is one of the things that our organization also, Shop Again, does really, really great. Let's look at why things are happening as opposed to what has happened. A lot of uh, modern medicine treats what is happening, they're treating the downstream problems. We have to look at more, look at the upstream problems. So think of your brain. We go to bed, we've, we've had a hard day, we've accumulated all this knowledge, we've gone, we've moved around, we, maybe we've done some exercise, there's a lot of garbage that we've collected. So if we don't have a good night's sleep, this is what we wake up, it's just about the same thing, the way it was when we went, before we went to sleep. With a good night's sleep, our brain is clean. Things are refreshed. Our physical body is restored and, and our and our brain is healthier. Uh, Hotly, we do have one question. Um, is it a bad, is it a sign of a bad night's sleep if we don't wake up hungry? Um, it's a sign of a bad night's sleep if we wake up tired. But we should, we, we should wake up wanting to eat. Uh, what happens is, um, uh, and we'll go into it later, but what happens when we don't sleep well uh, and our we don't shut off, shut down our sympathetic mode because we, for whatever reason, and there are a number of reasons, that we, we uh, maintain our state of hypervigilance. In order to do that, we have to prepare ourselves for an, an attack or what we what our brain believes is a threat and it raises our blood sugars and so we have these elevations in blood sugar throughout the night and and so um and often if we have a problem it's worse our sleep is worse right before we wake up so we'll get an elevation in blood sugar right before we wake up so we won't wake up hungry that alone you can't make a judgment that your sleep is poor by that reason alone, but it, it, it's a sign that you, there may be a sleep problem. So this, so about maybe less than 10 years ago, a researcher in Rochester, New York, came up with this, uh, this discovery of something called the glymphatic system. The brain doesn't have like a, a lymphatic system that cleans away waste, but there's a glymphatic system which is really incredible when you think about it. So what happens is the brain actually shrinks, opens up more space and more uh, cerebral spinal fluid will flow into the brain, clean out waste, including the uh, uh, amyloid products that build up uh, during the day. The interesting thing is it only happens when we sleep. This lymphatic system doesn't really function well uh, uh, during the day. It doesn't function all during the day, actually. And one of the things that modulates it is the uh, suppression of the sympathetic nervous system and uh, the lack of production of these uh, neurotransmitters, epinephrine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, which think, think about adrenaline, it's more like an adrenal, adrenaline thing. Um, so if we're not sleeping well, we, we don't get the right stages of sleep, and this usually occurs during most of the, the deep sleep more than uh, the REM sleep. If we're, if we're not sleeping well and we, we don't leave the sympathetic state, we will not have our brains uh, clean. Uh, Dale Bredesen, who I, I would assume that most of you know, has said that... Uh, uh, he now believes that oxygen desaturation or, or poor sleep may be the single most important factor in in brain health because these little bouts of oxygen desaturation, and we'll go over that a little bit more you know, in a while. These bouts, these episodes of oxygen desaturation over decades of time maybe 20 years later will lead to some first signs of memory loss 
and maybe another 10 years before you begin to have mild cognitive loss. So looking at sleep now and dealing with sleep problems now can prevent problems that can happen that can happen decades later. Doesn't mean that if that if you didn't look at it decades ago that you're gonna that you can't do anything about it now. It's never too late to try to uh, improve your sleep. So in addition to cleansing your brain, um, the other during REM sleep, there's memory consolidation, where all the things that that have happened during the day, they're like little sticky notes that are put all over your brain, and then and then we, they get sorted out, they get filed in the right compartments, they get associated with other things, they get put into context. That's why sleep is so important to young kids learning, because uh, without good sleep. They, they can learn the material, but they can't put it in context to where it belongs with, with something else. So, that, so the second important part of, uh, of sleep is consolidation of, of memory. And the third thing is the uh, relationship of uh, sleep to, to emotions. During, during REM sleep, we, we separate the memories from emotions. So then we can have the memories without necessarily having the, the emotions attached to them. Why is that important in people who have really bad emotional experience, like soldiers who have PTSD, they do not have the ability to separate emotions from, um, from memory. And they don't have good sleep. And so they continually, every time they think of something, the emotions associated with it, the strong emotions come into effect, which which actually prevents them from living th their life properly. So so sleep is is really vital for all these things. And here I have a, a little diagram of what happens during during sleep. And uh, during the first half of the night, I don't know can. Uh, Steve, can they see my my pointer on the screen? Yeah, we can see your pointer. So during the first half uh, <laughs> of the night, um, we'll go down. We'll we'll go to N two and and N three. These are what's called N three is deep sleep. Uh, this is wakefulness. This is deep sleep. And we go through this period of of of, uh, of cycles. Each cycle is about. Uh, 90 minutes to 120 minutes, an hour and a half to two hours. And then then we uh, will wake up a little bit and we'll have a little REM episode, which is where we might dream. And sometimes after a REM episode, we'll, we'll actually wake up uh, or not wake up completely. Uh, then we go back and we do the same cycle again. We're a little bit longer of, of deep sleep, another REM period. And uh, most of the first half of the night is mostly in good sleep, deep sleep. The second half of the night, there's, there's a lot more REM sleep. That's why the dreams that, that happen closer to the morning, we remember. So, uh, and once we're at any stage below wakefulness, we have no idea what's happening when we sleep. Like that... Uh, Steve mentioned at the beginning the four things that are covered in the webinars are, are nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, and sleep, which, which are all related. That um, if you're not eating well, you're not exercising, or you have stress, you know it. But if you're not sleeping well, you don't you don't know it. Your uh, bed partner may say, you know, like. You're tossing and turning all night. I heard you gasping or snoring. But if you're not sleeping well, you don't know it. Uh, you could have a problem where where you you don't sleep well, but you think you sleep well, or or it could be vice versa. The, the only way to know that is really to be tested. So one of the value what, what I help to do today is tell you how to screen yourself for a potential problem. And then if you think you have a problem or you think you have somebody in your family who has a problem, then they can take the next step and be tested. 
So the enemies of a good night's sleep are airway sleep and, uh, uh, and breathing issues, uh, which we'll go over, poor sleep hygiene. We get, we get into really bad habits like uh, reading our iPad or our phone before we go to sleep. Phones have blue lights on it. Blue lights prevent the release of melatonin. So uh, you, you get finished with your, your device, especially teenagers. You, you, it'll take a while before you can produce melatonin. They have these little filters you put on your, your phones and, and, and that's supposed to help. I don't really know whether it helps. Orange or, or red light are better because when our ancestors slept around the fire, gathered around the fire, that's where they slept where there's protection. But blue, blue light from uh, TVs or, or iPads or, or phones are, are destructive to, to sleep. And as I said before, if you watch the news and you you, you want to get your prepare for sleep, you you want to be in a in a good place. You want to be in a place where the room is cooler, because uh, uh, a warmer temperature will prevent uh, sleep. And also, if there's too much light in the room, if there's too much light, even shining on your skin, that'll prevent the uh, release of of melatonin. They've shown that people that live in where there's bright lights outside their house or um, or a lot of noise prevents sleep. Also diet. If you, if you have too much sugar or alcohol, then uh, that'll prevent sleep because it'll keep you in a more of a sympathetic mode or and stress and, uh, and, and temperature we mentioned before. And then uh, the way sleep gets altered, we can end up with short sleep or, or long sleep. Ideally, we should sleep between six and eight hours. If you sleep less than that or more than that, they're both bad. Your sleep architecture could be altered. Just like I showed you in that diagram before, if, you, if you're lacking REM sleep, you could have one set of problems if you're lacking uh, Deep sleep, you can have a different set of problems. So, so you need to know your sleep architecture. Uh, then, then there, there are the number of arousals that that occur, and then, then how often you have an oxygen desaturation, and and uh, whether your body temperature changes, whether your 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 blood pressure, which should be lower during the day, increases, and, and so a glucose level. So that if you are a diabetic type two diabetic, or you have a blood, pre a blood pressure problem and, and you're on medication. And the only time you don't seem to be controlled by that medication is the first thing when you get up in the morning, then you might have a sleep problem. And then um, all to sleep off. So especially uh, REM sleep or both will create poor performance, uh, poor memory, lack of human, of, of communication and uh, change your behavior and also will lead to inflammation. So, so we have really two, only two types of diseases. We have the diseases that we catch, which, which we can't control unless we hide out in a cave or the acquired diseases, which all almost every acquired disease uh, has some form of inflammation associated, whether it be diabetes, uh, cardiac, cardiovascular disease, um, cancer, Alzheimer's, uh, any of those diseases are acquired and they all are, pre are preventable. So let's just go through some, some terminology here. So sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is when you stop breathing. And when, when they measure an episode, an episode is usually has to be 10 seconds to consider, be considered uh, an apneic episode. And hypopnea is where you don't stop breathing, but there's you, you're working harder to breathe. So there's a reduction of airflow of, of at least 30% and an oxygen reduction of 4%. Some um, Medicare is 4%. 
American Academy of Sleep Medicine says 3%. So the test, the scoring is a little, little bit different. So the, they add up the ap number of apneic events, number of a, a apnea events that come up with an index called the AHI. So if you go for a sleep test, what they tell you is your AHI. And, uh, and then depending on the number of events, which are average over an hour, that you will either have a problem or not, not have a problem. Sometimes you'll do a home sleep test with, and they'll get a score. But if you have a home sleep test, one of the factors of a home sleep test, they don't know when you're sleeping. The, the, uh, the assumption is if you're not moving, you're sleeping. But if you're just staying, aw you're staying awake, and uh, and you're not moving, the machine can make the assumption that, that you're sleeping. So if you score a certain amount of episodes based on your sleep, but you're not sleeping, you would generally that whatever is on a home sleep test will be higher if you do an over, overnight test. Um, and the severity of your of the of a problem is called the respiratory disturbance. Index, which also include something called RERAs, which are where you you have more difficulty breathing, but it's it's not really high hypopnea. And then there's the oxygen desaturation index, which probably is a better indication of what what your problem is. Uh, Dr. Gimeno, who was who created the AHI index, said uh, near the end of his life, he said. The worst thing I ever did for medicine was creating this index. Why? Because it doesn't matter whether you uh, have apnea. Because when when your brain says, "Oh my God, we're not breathing," I got to deal with that. You either can not deal with it and have apnea, or wake up and have an arousal. It doesn't matter. The effect on the brain is exactly the same. It it, it doesn't matter. But in medicine today, if you have a test and they say, well, you don't have apnea, you don't have a problem. But if you have, a, but it, if you look at it with more detail, you might have a problem. So just because you do a test or home sleep test, if the symptoms show that there is a problem, uh, I would go more by the symptoms than by the, uh, by, by the test. So the score is, AHI 5 to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, and greater than 30 is, is, is severe. If you, if you get tested, you get treatment, whether it's a CPAP, all appliance, or surgery, if you don't get your score below 5, you won't get the health benefits of, of the treatment. I put some information in here, and these will all be on YouTube, so... We, we don't have to read all this. I put it in just so you'll have that. You want to go back and look at it. And um, snoring is, is uh, not necessarily considered a health problem. It's considered a social problem. But, but if you snore, you're not breathing well. And, and if you look at your how it affects your autonomic nervous system, it'll have a negative effect on your autonomic nervous system. Uh, Airflow obstruction. These are the things that can affect the uh, airflow. The thing that we deal with in our office for sleep is mostly, are there any conditions, mouth and nose that could affect uh, breathing? Can we help a patient with either an oral appliance or with uh, some kind of dentistry or um, maybe orthodontic treatment where we expand the arches because the uh, our tongues are the front wall of our airway and if uh, there's not enough room for a tongue in, in in the house this house is where our teeth are the walls and the roof of the mouth or the ceiling of the house the house is too small the only place the tongue can go is back and, and can cause a problem so um airflow and sleep can be affected by anything that that causes our nose to be blocked Nasal breathing is 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 so much better than breathing through your mouth. But that's a whole other lecture. And then the things that we do to try to help us sleep, 
maybe she says, you know, I fall asleep much better if I if I have a glass of wine or something. Um, but you're not sleeping as well because your sleep architecture will be disrupted. Same for drugs, same for pain, pain medication. Almost every single pain medication will cause poor sleep. Uh, people who are trying to earn addiction and in recovery, almost everyone has a sleep problem. And, and, and also weight gain can, can be a problem. Uh, the, the other thing that's uh, for the, the effect of inflammation and on our cardiac system, uh, when we have uh, an apneic episode, negative pressure is created. What's negative pressure? Negative pressure is if you're drinking through a straw and I would squeeze the straw, your, your cheeks are pulled in. What happens when you you have negative pressure? There's pressure on your uh, on the chest and you, because of the uh, uh, the airway is closing. And as there's pressure on your chest and your heart, your brain believes that you, you're uh, accumulating fluid, and it sends out a out a, a neurotransmitter that tells you get up and go to the bathroom. And so that if you have a problem where you get up at night to go to the bathroom and you don't go as often during the day, that would be another indication uh, of a sleep problem. Also, that if your blood sugar drops or 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 goes too high at night, they both can be a, be a problem. So there are so many things that can interfere with, with sleep. And, and uh, th this is, uh, I don't know whether everybody's seen the Bredesen 7, and, and um, even before there was a Bredis in seven, there was a Sharp again, uh, 10 reversible causes. So I think Sharp again was sort of predated Bredis and before he published his first, first work. But what I'm trying to show you is that all these things, nutrition and sleep, exercise and sleep, if, if you're uh, not sleeping well, you don't have the same desire to exercise. If you don't exercise, you're you may be mentally tired, but you're not physically tired. It's so that those two go together. If you eat the wrong foods at the wrong time, it'll affect your sleep. And if you don't sleep well, two things will happen. The um, there's a hormone released by a our stomach called leptin that tells us that we've eaten too much, but the leptin receptors in our brain get damaged and, and don't work as well. So we don't know that we've eaten as well. So we lose the ability to know that we, we're, we're satisfied. And if we don't sleep well, we're going to crave carbohydrates because we're tired during the day. And so a lot of people have trouble uh, losing weight. They get up and they say, you know, it's Monday morning. I'm going to start this diet and I'm going to be lose weight. And then sometime, either it's that day or the next day, Something happens in the afternoon where they just crave carbohydrates and they feel a poor will willpower, but it's physiological. If you're not sleeping well, you're going to crave carbohydrates. Same thing for, for um, being, being stressed. If you go to bed stressed, you're not going to be able to sleep well. And if you don't sleep well, you're going to be more stressed. And then as far as toxicity goes, a lot of people are concerned about levels of heavy metals, mercury, zinc, or other toxins, if you don't sleep well, you cannot detoxify because uh, you have to be in a in an alkaline state, in a parasympathetic state in order to detoxify. So there's an interconnection be between the two. So I'm just going to quickly go through um, what you can do. Uh, years ago, I created this thing called SMART. SMART is, uh, this is for pr practitioners, which I sort of uh, modify. Discreet, screen, measure, assess, refer, and treat. So for screening, and these are all going to be in the slides, so you can go back and look at that. And if anybody wants a copy of any of these, just uh, send it to my email, and I'll, I'll, I'll make that and send, send it to you. This is a, a questionnaire. If you answer yes to three or more of these questions, the, 
there's uh, enough information. And a screening is, if you're positive for a screening, it means you should be tested further to see whether you actually have, have a problem. If you test negative for screening, you may or may not have a problem and you, you probably shouldn't necessarily go through with the further testing. A second one is called the stop bang. Very easy to do. Um, stop is, is uh, stands for snoring, tiredness. Somebody observed you stop breathing if your blood pressure is, is elevated. And then there's, uh, the bang is your BMI over 35. And there's there are ways to calculate that based on your weight and your, and your height. If you're over third, um, over 50, if your next size is greater than 16, if you're a male, I think it's 14 if you're a female. Um, and, and if you're a man, you're more prone to apnea. So three or more, if you have three or more of these factors, you should have a sleep test. And this this is a uh, this is called the Epworth study. It asks you. Uh, it looks at daytime sleepiness. How how likely would you fall asleep under these conditions? And as I said, you can either go back through the slides, look at that, or just email me, and I'll send you a copy of that. And these are these are the conditions that um, that are comorbidities that happen when you have a sleep problem which are uh, more prone to traffic accidents too, would be reflux, snoring, blood pressure, diabetes, neck and back pain, tooth grinding, uh, inability to concentrate, poor posture, and, um, and AFib, cardiac arrhythmias, depression, forgetfulness. If you have any one of these conditions, that's the reason to check your sleep. There are so many people who have these conditions that could be helped or have them slow down or reversed and never have had a sleep test. It, it makes no sense to me. Uh, and, and these are some other conditions related to uh, poor, poor sleep. And, then, and the other factor is these are medications that, that affect sleep. So if you're on any of these medications, and as I said before, uh, any kind of pain medications, sleep medications, uh, alcohol, which is a, a medication, drinking caffeine. Some people, if they have uh, strong coffee or caffeine after two or three o'clock in the afternoon, it's gonna affect their, their sleep. Uh, great thing to do is to keep a diary of what you've eaten during the day and how it affects sleep. They also have these, uh, Things you can wear called continuous glucose monitors that can measure what your glucose is and do you get spikes in glucose after you eat certain foods because you know, we're all different. We cannot be treated the same. Uh, get back. Uh, back. So um, let's say you, you test positively for screening. What's the next step? Next step is to have some sort of a sleep test, um, H, a home sleep test, H, H, HSD is a home sleep test, uh, which will, that if you test positive for, for a problem with a home sleep test, you have a problem. If you test negative, you may or may not have a problem. And then you should have a, a PSG, which is overnight uh, test. You can also have a cone beam, which is a three-dimensional x-ray, which can see what the airway is which give you information, but it's, it doesn't take the place of a sleep test. And there's uh, something called heart rate variability, which measures the, the changes in your autonomic nervous system, which can show that are you making that shift from daytime sympathetic to nighttime parasympathetic? And if you're not, that, that would be an indication of a sleep test. And then an ENT can do, uh, do further testing which is um, called a dice test where they, they uh, put you to sleep with some medication and they put a tube down the back of your nose and see whether your airway is closing when, when you sleep. We and have so just when, about five minutes left, Howie. I have three minutes. Oh, okay. 
Oh, all right. So um, we get all the information, then we then it gets assessed as as to what the problem is, and how do you assemble uh, a team to treat that? Who, who do, that depending upon what the problem is, is it a, a breathing problem? Is it something a dentist can address with oral appliance? Do you need a an MD for to to uh, offer you a CPAP? Sometimes people need both in order for the best results. Is it a, is it a, a nose breathing problem where ENT might want to do some type of of uh, of treatment or surgery because a uh, long time sleep problem causes collapse of the cartilage in the nose and and it, and it gets worse if you uh, use something like uh, a mute or uh, something to open the nose at night and you're breathing better and you're sleeping better then you know it's more nasal than it, than a uh, um, oral problem. Uh, you might want an integrated MD to to look at diet and nutrition, uh, a physical therapist to look at posture. People who don't sleep well or have a problem have a forward head position. Uh, and uh, lastly, how do you put all this together? What if you need several things and you're also working on trying to preserve your memory, you need somebody who's who's going to be your, your health coach. I mean, I one of my uh, my goals is to have health coaches much more widely used and recognized because in today's day and age, doctors don't have the time in order to uh, spend with patients to teach them because it's not just offering treatment. The patient needs to be a partner in, in the treatment. And so these are the some of the available treatments for sleep problems, a, a dental um, appliance, uh, orthodontic treatment, myofunctional therapy, which is uh, a form of physical therapy for the muscles of the of the of the of breathing and and the mouth, positioning the tongue, medical. There's a CPAP. There, there's surgery where they they'll cut away part of the uh, uvula and palate. I don't recommend that. That's highly unsuccessful. A new thing is Inspire, which is like a a pacemaker for the tongue. They implant a little device under the tongue, and you and every time you begin to have an apnea episode, it stimulates the muscle and it pulls the tongue forward. Sleep hygiene we've talked about changing your nutrition. Sometimes we get into this loop of stress and biofeedback and and uh, exercise can can help. But whatever your problem is, if you want to get the best result, you need collaborative care. And and but if you sleep better, you'll have a better brain, better health, and a and a better life. And that's it. I'm done. Okay. Okay. We do have a question. Uh if you take thyroid meds, armor thyroid, does it help to take it at a certain time? I take mine in the middle of the night. This was suggested by my doctor. Well, first question I would ask, like, why would you wake up in the middle of the night to take medication? Like, but thyroid uh, meds, you do have to take on an empty stomach. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, that uh, most that, that that if you're sleeping better, you have the ability to reduce your thyroid medication because one, oh, of, one of the one of the downstreams effect of uh, of not sleeping well is you don't get that restful period at night you begin to uh, get adrenal fatigue so there's this when we talk about upstream and downstream problems once you first you have adrenal fatigue and then the thyroid begins to try to do the work that the adrenal glands are supposed to and and then they get fatigued then you become hypothyroid. And um, she did you know, clarify that she takes them in really the middle of the night because she's using the bathroom. Yeah. So anyway. do you remember what I, I said? Ask yourself, do you go to the bathroom, have to get up and go to the bathroom at a shorter interval than you do during the day? Then it may be related to a sleep issue uh, that the fact you have to get up to go to the mm -hmm. bathroom because, because there, there, are, there are people who say, oh, 
I don't have a sleep problem. I just get up because I go to the bathroom. But when their sleep improves, they don't get up to go to the bathroom. They sleep through the night or they, instead of getting up two or three times, they get up once or twice. That's that's an improvement. That's that's one of the things that we look for. So uh, I'm going to give a shout out. I got a couple of my patients. I got uh, Charles and Diana and Pro Flo are, are here. Nice to see you on the uh, on the webinar. I'm sorry, Susan. What were you going to say? One more question. What types of pain medications interfere? Would that be Tylenol and Aleve or more opioid type? More, more of the opioid, opioids would be especially anything that's anti-inflammatory might be uh, beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you uh, are waking up in pain or you're waking up with muscle stiffness and, and you feel more uh, in, inflammation that also could be a sign of a, of a sleep problem. Good sleep is incredibly reparative. Inflammation mm -hmm. goes down um, and we feel better when we get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, if if we don't sleep well, instead of having less inflammation, we have more inflammation in the morning. So if you feel really achy and sore, and then when you move around a little bit, or you have that that you feel better. It also could be an indication of, of a sleep problem. The most important thing is, if you have any of the conditions that might say you have a sleep problem, don't ignore it. A lot of uh, healthcare providers don't look at, at sleep. If you're doing everything great with nutrition, you have everything balanced and you're not sleeping well, then 16 hours of the day, things are great. And eight hours of the day, you're reversing everything you did for the, those 16. So I'm not saying that everybody has a sleep problem, but if you do, don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. Get it checked out. Yeah. Um, and one last question. What, um, what about you taking melatonin? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Uh... Well, again, we're looking at upstream versus downstream problem. So mm -hmm. it, melatonin can help, but problems with, that people have with melatonin is sometimes it'll it'll work for a while and then it doesn't work mm -hmm. because there are other things. It, it's part of a of a, a continuum of a reaction. Melatonin gambit. We we this shift from daytime to nighttime. Um, there, there are time-release melatonin. People can take GABA, but you need to look at the, the total picture. You can't look at one element. The melatonin will help for some people. There's a whole thing about whether you should be giving melatonin to children or not. There can be a reaction to that. Uh, so yes, it's beneficial, but if and, and if it helps, just say, all right, what else am I doing? Maybe I'm I'm looking at my iPad. I'm reading on my iPad before I go to sleep. Maybe if you, if it, that wasn't done, your body would produce be producing its own melatonin. Well, Dr. Hinden, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and um, it was uh, enlightening. Um, I, uh, hopefully you'll come back and join us again one day. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, you know